And this brings us to a generic concept, expectation maximization, that is used in clustering and topic modeling and many other cases of this lecture. And in the context of clustering, it is usually equated with Gaussian mixture modeling that is optimized by expectation maximization. But the algorithmic concept is more general and more applicable. And in fact, the k-means algorithm, the standard algorithm for k-means, is one instance of expectation maximization. So we have these poor results, same slide as before from the pictures, slightly different text. We want to find a better result. And the idea is, what if we not only model the mean, but also a radius? So the problem of k-means was that if I have these three cluster centers and I split my data set halfway, I am bound to get this type of split. The way to make it work better is to allow splitting at a different split point between the two clusters. So to some extent, I want to have a larger radius here and a smaller radius there. If I would model the clusters with both a center and a radius, this data set would suddenly become easy. So how do I get a radius into k-means? The naive approach would be to add a scaling factor to each one. And if I put a, like a small weight factor on the deviations to one cluster, it would become larger. But I need to estimate the radius somehow in each iteration. And that is kind of unclear what is a decent way of doing this. But if we consider these as Gaussian distributions, then we suddenly have quite good mathematical tools to estimate such things. So we want to fit Gaussian distributions to the data for this low dimensional case. We won't be using this on text for obvious reasons. So we have a standard multivariate Gaussian distribution, the one in, that we have in the top. We have our deviation from the center, and we multiply this from both sides to a uh, matrix. The matrix constrains the shape of the cluster. It's called uppercase sigma because it corresponds to the lowercase sigma in the one-dimensional case, in the one-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And we have a normalization term on the left-hand side that has the usual purpose of making the integral of this PDF to be 1. So it's a proper probability distribution function. By this shape of the sigma, we can model the shape of the cluster. Similar to a standard Gaussian distribution in one dimension, where we can increase the sigma to make the cluster larger or smaller, right, the size of the distribution, we can do this. So that is the radius to some extent. Except that this is like a multivariate radius. It's not just going into one direction, but it can be different in different directions. And it is obtained in this case by the inverse of the covariance matrix in the usual um, case. That is my standard estimator that you would obtain from a, a least squared approach. We can constrain it to be, for example, only diagonal. And of course, a diagonal matrix is much more efficient. It can multiply in linear time instead of quadratic time. It has lower, very lower degrees of freedom and all these benefits. If I do this, I get a cluster that looks like the one up here, like the cluster B. It is elongated in some directions where we have a larger value and shorter in others. 
but it's no longer rotated. The rotation needs the combination of more than one axis. I don't have this on a diagonal. And I can take the unit matrix and then take it sigma times, lowercase sigma times. I get a multiple of the unit matrix, and then I will get a cluster of the type C that is spherical, but with a different radius. And this particular case will, of course, be enough for the Mickey Mouse data set that we just had. And then I can consider to tie this across multiple clusters, which is good for very special cases. Now, doing this with a multivariate Gaussian is very nice because the marginals of a Gaussian, a Gaussian, and all of that. So I get um, a lot of mathematical power, mat mathematical tools that I can use. I have all of the interesting equations, they are solved. I know how to combine the density of two Gaussians, for example. So um, that is like the easiest approach that we could pick not because this equation is easy, but because this equation is very, very well understood. So I don't have to reinvent anything. And now we want to go to the EM algorithm. How do we optimize this? How do we cluster data using such an approach? And the general principle is the same as we had with the standard algorithm of k-means. We choose initial model parameters. In k-means, you would choose k centers randomly. And the position of the k centers, they would be our theta vector, or parameters of the model. This is parametric modeling, what we are doing here. Then I can expect my latent variables, so the things that I cannot, opt, cannot observe, which is the cluster assignment. And I can expect them given my current model parameters and the data. In k-means, that means I'm expecting the cluster label by checking which cluster is the closest. And that's like my best guess for the cluster label. And then I can update my parameters to make them fit better to the labels. I want to explain the labels that I've just assigned, give best with the model parameters. So I'm doing a maximum likelihood estimation for my model parameters. I want to choose the most likely model parameters. And in k-means, we simply used the arithmetic center of each cluster, because that is the least squares maximum likelihood estimator. And then we can repeat this. And in k-means, we could repeat this until nothing changes. And that would kind of optimize the sum of squares. You won't find the overall optimum, but it will improve this in every step until some local fixed point. Now, for Gaussian, we need to replace our model. We want a model that includes the radius. This model only included the centers. So we simply put in a model in here that is more complicated. It now looks like this. That looks complex and huge, but it is very simple because it's k times the same thing. It is k times a cluster center. It is k times the cluster shape. And it's k times a weight of the cluster. How important is this cluster compared to the remainder? If we were looking at a probability distribution point of view, we want to have a combined distribution that is the sum of multiple Gaussian distributions. And in this sum, I put a weight in front of each of my Gaussian. And if all the weights sum up to one, I have a probability distribution afterwards. So that is the constraint that we want to have in here. And now I'm doing the same thing. I'm choosing my initial model parameters. For example, I'm choosing k centers randomly and unit matrix as my covariance matrix, because that tends to not break easily, and a uniform weight. 
So every one is given one by k weight. And then I can expect my cluster labels based on the density of my Gaussian distribution. That's why we had this equation on the previous slide. I can compute this because I have these values. That is what I need to compute the density. So I can now identify which cluster each point belongs to. But I will be distributing this. So if it can belong to 80% to one cluster, 10% to another, 10% to a third cluster. That is OK. I want to make a soft approach now for um, good reasons. But I could do a hard assignment. So um, it's nothing breaking if I do, the, do a hard assignment. And then I can compute the Gaussians. We update them. So I will need to update my center, my covariance matrix, and my weight. And I can actually do the standard estimation techniques from statistics, estimating the parameters of a multivariate Gaussian. Nothing fancy in here except that we have these soft assignments. And then I can repeat this. The main problem that now arises is if I do the soft assignment, I have an infinite number of assignments. I can change them in very small increments. So it won't converge. Not in the sense that I will stop changing. The changes will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I have to define some threshold. And if it does not change enough, I can stop. Now I'm not optimizing the sum of squares anymore. But what I am optimizing in this case is the log likelihood. Because I'm assigning objects to fit the, uh, like with the probability density, and I'm optimizing the uh, models to fit the data best in a likelihood estimation way. So I'm minimizing, I optimize the likelihood, maximizing it. And I will be looking at the log likelihood for computational reasons, which then is the sum of the logs of my points given the model. So for every point, I'm using all my models to explain them. I get a probability, I take the log, and I take the sum in here. And logically, I want to optimize L. But of course, L would look something like a product over all my probabilities of each point given my model. Now, this, this product is problematic because we have small probabilities. And multiplying a lot of them will eventually be 0. So computing it this way is problematic. Going to the log space and transforming the product into the sum is much nicer. Also a very common technique. And now we can put this together to get Gaussian mixture modeling. And the reason why I'm doing this in detail here, despite it not being suited for text, is that we will be doing pretty much the same thing for text later in this class, in topic modeling. So I have, my prob have to find an equation for my probability of point x given cluster zi for each of my clusters. And that is essentially my PDF, my standard Gaussian definition, except that I can put in the actual values for my covariance and for my center. But this will be a PDF. This is not a probability. It is a probability density. A probability density can be anything uh, non-negative. It can be much more than one, so it's not a probability. If you have a very tiny compact cluster with a low de standard deviation, it will be a high peak. If it's very wide, it will be a low peak. So it is, so far, it is only a PDF. Now we use, um, we can use, still use Bayes' rule to turn around this term. We don't want the 
probability of the point in this moment, the density, but we want actually the probability of a cluster being the correct label of the point. Because we want to estimate to which cluster point x belongs. Point x is given. We have that point in the data. It exists. So there's no uncertainty about the point being there. But what we want to find is the correct labeling of the point. And we can do this with the usual Bayes rule. So we get p of x given ci divided by p of x. And we can substitute this top term. But this probability of x is problematic. What is the probability of having a point at these coordinates? We don't know. We can't know, actually, unless we have the um, way the data was generated. So that, that doesn't quite work yet. But we can use the law of total probability. And the law of total probability in this case says every point must belong to the clusters. There's no point that comes from somewhere else. All the points must be generated by our clusters. So the law of total probability tells me that the sum over all of these, the sum over the ci given x over all clusters i must be 1. They have the same denominator. So I can kind of pull this in the top. I can then look at the total sum. And I can use this to normalize my equation. And that is how I get this normalization term in here. That is the sum over all p c i given x. And then I have removed the p of x, which occurred on top and bottom. Hmm? Yeah, the, the algorithm assumes there are no outliers in this data set. Or let's say no outliers beyond the outliers that exist in the, in the Gaussian distribution. And the Gaussian has outliers. Yes, but um, there is the assumption that there's, let's say, no uniform cluster generating background noise or anything like this. And that's the point where it comes in, yes. And now we can compute this. And it's not particularly hard to compute this, but we have to compute this, this PDF for every cluster and then take the sum and normalize it. So now we can distribute what is called the responsibility for each point. And this will be will sum to 1. Every point will have a responsibility that is distributed on all clusters, but it will sum up to 1. And now I can update my models. And I'm using a minimum, uh, yeah, maximum likelihood approach, kind of minimizing this, the squared deviations of the things. So just with k-means, where we have to use the arithmetic mean, our mean will be the arithmetic mean. So that, that's the, yeah, that's, that's correct. So this is kind of an arithmetic mean, except that we have weights in here. So if a point is belonging 80% to cluster 1, it will have an influence of a weight of 80% towards the mean of cluster 1. And maybe 10% will influence another center. So this is a weighted arithmetic mean that we have in here. And our weight is the responsibility of the cluster. And it turns out that we use this weight overall. It's always the same weighting. If the point belongs 80% to the cluster, it has 80% when computing the mean. It has 80% of weight when computing the covariance matrix. It has 80% of weight 
for the sum of weights. This wi is simply the sum, the, like the average weight um, of the objects in there. So a cluster that has very few weight in here will have a small w. A cluster that gets a lot of weight from the points will have a higher influence. This covariance matrix is also estimated in the usual way we estimate covariance matrices. We do the variance, the covariance, which is the deviation from the center in component J and the deviation from the center in component K multiplied together. So this is also our stand, kind of standard weighted covariance. Nothing fancy in here except that we have the weights. And in fact, if you rem just remember the definition of covariance and how covariance is computed, put in the weight and most likely you will put in the right way. And this gives us the algorithm for EM clustering or Gaussian mixture modeling, but we don't actually have the Gaussians in this uh, pseudocode. We choose an initial model. We, we compute the log likelihood of the initial model. We need some log value for um, detecting convergence. Then we expect the probabilities of each x, how likely it belongs to each cluster. We can then maximize the new model parameters, so that's computing the mean and the covariance. And then during this, we can compute the log likelihood. Then. So how likely is each point generated by the new model, and this value has to improve. But at some point, this change in improvement will be so tiny, maybe unstable, that's why I'm putting the absolute value in here, but the value may be so tiny, we don't see much change in, in this anymore, and then we can stop the algorithm. So that is the key idea of Gaussian mixture modeling. We can't use it on text this way. The, the obvious reason is that uh, we have huge matrices in here, covariance matrices on 10,000 dimensions. They will just break. They don't work. They will become singular. So it won't work on text data. The other question, and that's the one that is more imp important actually to us, is, is it the right thing to do? Are we just using this because it's fancy or are we using it because it's, uh, we have a reason to do so? But the reason would be, is my data Gaussian distributed? And no, my TF-IDF vectors are not Gaussian distributed, so I shouldn't be using it. So it is not a good choice for text. It does not exploit sparsity. I can integrate a little bit into my covariance computation to save some effort, but that's about it. And these covariance matrices, they are quadratic in size. So if I have 10,000 dimensions, I have for each cluster a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix that I need to estimate accurately. I need a lot of data to make this work. So that this is not a good idea. And the naive approach of doing the matrix inversion in this case, if, and then here I would need the full inverted matrix, takes cubic processing time to invert the matrix. So Gaussian mixture modeling is never a good idea for high dimensional data. So one more reason to not use it here. Nevertheless, it makes a lot of sense in this class because we have been taking a probability density function, a parametric um, model, and fitting this to the data. Gaussian is, the easy, is an easy choice, but why do, are we restricted to doing this with Gaussians? Well, we could do a Bernoulli or a multinomial distribution instead. These work well for presence and absence data. So is a word cont contained in my cluster or not in my document? Or multinomial, how often does word A occur in my document? I can model these. 
And well, I need to estimate the parameters, and I need to have a probability density function. I have probability density function for them. I just need to decide on how to optimize my likelihood. But Bernoulli and multinomial are not difficult distributions either. I can do this. And we will be doing this in topic modeling. So to some extent, some topic modeling approaches are the idea of the same idea as Gaussian mo mixture modeling, just transformed to a distribution that makes more sense for text, binomial distribution, multinomial distributions. So Bernoulli mixture modeling, we could devise a method with this name. <coughs> 